All right, now, stand up. Tell somebody you're glad to see them. Let's get this awkwardness out of the way. Go ahead, let them know, let them know. turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Let's get in the Word now. Ephesians 6, find your place. Stand as we read the Word of God. Ephesians 6, verses 17 through 20 today. We're going to finish up our series uh, Under Armour, Engaged in Warfare and Able for Victory today. Ephesians 6, starting at the last part of verse 17. Um, This is the last piece of the spiritual armor that Paul writes about. He says, And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Let's pray together. Lord, we ask that you would be glorified as we study your precious word today. Thank you for the grace that has been imparted to our lives um, by by your love, by your mercy. Thank you, God, that you are consistently um, pleading our cause. And thank you for Jesus, who who is our intercessor, um, who is always saying that that if they are covered with, with my blood, the Lord sees his son in us. Thank you, God, for that reminder today. Thank you for the promise of eternal life. Uh, If we would just put our faith and our trust in what Jesus has done on the cross. Thank you, Lord, um, for bringing us together for for this time in your precious word. And I pray, God, that lives would be changed as we study the word today. That we would be moved um, to respond to your holy scripture. And, Lord, I pray that the spirit of God um, would just cover this place and that we would be forever changed. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Today I'm talking to you about the sword of the spirit, and I want to take you back to the year uh, 1524 through 1526. In Germany, in Germany, there was an uprising that started, and it was called the Peasants' War. And you know what? Uh, this is this is what happened back then. Uh, poor people who worked in the fields, they decided that they didn't like working in the fields any longer. And so they rose up against uh, they rose up against their feudal lords, and they, they started a revolt, an uprising right there in Germany. And this was their hope. They wanted to see change. They wanted to see reform. Uh, they wanted to see that economically. They wanted to see that socially. And so they just start a revolt. Now I know I know we live in the 21st century, and the same things happen today, right? Same same thing happens. People get upset. They start they start a revolt. They start a protest. They start riots. And and this is part of their reason. They, at first, you know, you could empathize with them or sympathize with them. You know, they, they were being treated unfairly and they, they wanted the world to know it. Well, they thought that their uprising would be justified if they could get the support uh, of a man none other than Martin Luther. All right, Martin Luther. I'm not talking about Martin Luther King Jr. of the 60s. I'm talking about Martin Luther of, of the 16th century, okay? Uh, Martin Luther, um, he was one of the reformers. Actually, he, he, he started through, through the power of the Lord, started this great reformation through much of Europe, specifically Germany. But this is what Martin Luther stood for. He stood for strong interpretation, accurate interpretation of the Word of God. And that's what he challenged the Catholic Church with. Well, the peasants, they saw what Martin Luther did, you know, start to reform and stuff. And they're like, you know what? If he can do it, we can do it too. We'll start a reform. We'll start, we'll start a revolt. And, and they said, you know what? If we can get Martin Luther behind this, oh, yeah, it, this will definitely happen. Well, well, at first, Martin Luther, he was, he was sympathetic to what was going on. He, he, he kind of understood their struggles. He kind of understood this uprising. But as time progressed, this is what happened. The peasants got violent. Okay, and they started revolting, and they started disputing, and they resulted to, to violence and, and arrogance. And the more that Martin Luther saw it, 
the more he was opposed to it, the more he didn't like it. As a matter of fact, Luther said that, that he thought what they were doing was in opposition to the Word of God. He said that, that people of God ought not to be rising up against uh, the government. As a matter of fact, we should respect the government and pray for the government, submit to the government as the Word says. And so ultimately, Martin Luther was opposed, and he said this. He said this about their revolt. He says, never should we operate by force, not by force, but by the Word of God. That's what he said. Not by force, but by the Word of God. Now listen, folks, I'm not, I'm not trying to spark you know, some, some debate on your views on protests and things like that. But Martin Luther had a strong point, had a strong point. He believed that the only way to change a person's heart, the only way that a person's heart would change, the only way a group of people's hearts would change would be because of the word of God. God, inspired by the Spirit of God, because of the Son of God, he felt like that the Word of God would be the thing that pierced the heart of man, changing their life forever, changing their love forever, changing their lordship forever, changing their leadership forever. He believed that if change was going to happen, it was going to happen by the preaching and the teaching and the believing of the Word of God for eternity. Now, and I want to say that to you today as well. What will change the world? What will change the ways of man? It will be, in fact, the very word of God. All right? Not the, not the, not the uh, efforts of man, okay? But the word of God is what will change lives. As a matter of fact, when, when Luther was asked about the success of the Reformation in his time, when he was asked about the success, this is what he said. He said, I did nothing. I only preached the word. I only taught the word. As a matter of fact, he, he helped to write the word in the German language. And he said, and while I slept, God shook up the world. <laughs> that's, that's what he said about the Reformation. Real change, real, real heart change, real life change happens by the word of God, not by the efforts of man. Listen, folks, this is what I mean by this. Listen, laws cannot change the human heart. <laughs> Laws fire people up, don't they? <laughs> All right? Uh, laws cannot change the human heart. If that were the case, if laws could change the human heart, I'd be a politician. You'd vote for me, wouldn't you? Just by show of hands. If I ran for president, would you vote for me? Anybody? Hey, you got a few. Oh, you're crazy. You're great. Okay? How about this? Okay? Education. Education can't change the human heart. Educators do great things. We have great educators in our church family. We love our teachers, don't we? We do. We love our teachers, okay? But teachers, educators, can't change the human heart. If that were the case, I'd be an educator, all right? Money can't change the human heart. You know that. Money can't change the human heart. If that were the case, then I would be a loan officer, or I'd be the host of The Price is Right, okay? If, if money could change the human heart. By the way, I'm pretty good at that game as I get older. Okay, money won't change the human heart. Medicine and surgery won't change the human heart either. Listen, if that were the case, we'd be doctors, be surgeons if we could change the human heart. Now listen, listen. Uh, uh, what does the world need? What will change the heart of man? What will defeat your enemy, conquer your enemy? The Word of God. Everybody say, the Word of God. Word. Yes, and, and here we are in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. We are studying about the last piece of armor here in our series. And I do hope, folks, I do hope that, that this series has boosted your knowledge of, of, of spiritual warfare. But I also hope that it has encouraged you to suit up daily and to seek victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because here's the thing, victory is yours all the time. Victory in Jesus is yours all the time, okay? I, I hope that you know that. I hope that you know that you don't have to pray for victory. You get to fight because of victory. It's already been given to you, okay? God's already given you the victory through Jesus Christ. The enemy, though, wants to uh, steal that assurance of victory. He wants to steal that confidence away that you have in God. So what he does, what the enemy does, is he wages war with us, and he wages war with the Lord in us. Now, 
For those of you who may have missed out on some messages, previous messages, I'm going to do one final recap today of this text in Ephesians chapter 6. We began this series long ago by talking about the reality that we are in an intense war, okay? We have a call to war. We have a great battle, a great conflict taking place, a battle for your heart, a battle for your attention, a battle for your strength in the Lord. And we talked about if we've got this call to war, then we've been given a cause for victory, okay? We've been given a way out. We've been given a, an opportunity to fight the enemy in this war. And Paul calls us in verse 10, he says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And then he says, put on the full armor, the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, we reminded ourselves, this first message in this series, we had to remind ourselves who the real enemy is. Y'all understand that? You remember who the real enemy is? We know our enemy is not flesh and blood. Our enemy is Satan himself. And, and our enemy is using his forces to fight against our life and our freedom in Christ Jesus. Now, here's the bad news about the warfare. If you live for the Lord Jesus Christ long enough, and you continue to serve him, if you continue to have weekends like you've had this last weekend, if you keep seeing the Lord move and serve through your life, if you keep seeing God at work in your life, then there's going to be a good chance that the enemy's going to fight you hard. Hey, that's all right. <laughs> that's fine. Okay, because we know who our victor is, don't we? Amen. In Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul wrote, you're in a war. You need to be prepared. And so he writes, put on the whole armor of God. And he says, start with the belt of truth. Start by girding your waist with truth. Be ready for warfare, he says. Take up the responsibility to fight. And by all means, renew your mind daily, daily as you, as you serve the Lord. And then he says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Every day you live in the precious righteousness of Jesus Christ. Jesus has made you righteous by his blood. He has placed his righteousness over you. But we talked about as we put on the breastplate of righteousness, we have a call to live righteous lives ourselves. Just because righteousness has been placed on you doesn't mean necessarily that you practice righteousness. So we have a responsibility to live out righteous lives. And then Paul, uh, then Paul said, put on your shoes, those gospel shoes. Okay, these were like cleats. These were all about your standing. These were all about your power against the enemy, standing power against the enemy. These were about standing your ground, finding your strength, your stability, and the truth of the gospel. And then Paul says, take up, take up the shield of faith so that you can quench. The word says, all, all the fiery darts of the enemy. See, something that we learned about our enemy is that sometimes he's a coward and he likes to shoot from distances. And so he likes to, you know, there's these flaming arrows all around you in this warfare. Whatever he can get you, you know, he'll, he'll try to do. But in faith, we put on this protection against the darts of the enemy. As a matter of fact, this shield is supposed to quench all of the darts of the enemy because in faith, here it is, in faith we claim the promises of God against all of our enemies' ploys. Against, again, the war is against your strength. Uh, the war is against your standing in the Lord. And so if you drop the shield, you're going to get hit. So he says, shield up in faith. Then a few weeks ago, we talked about the helmet of salvation. Satan is always attacking the assurance of your salvation and mine. All right? The, the assurance of your he want, he wants you to question what Jesus has done in you and what Jesus has done for you. He wants that authority. Satan wants that position of Christ over your life and heart. He wants to take over. He wants to steal that authority. And so the helmet of salvation is about winning the battle of the mind. Understanding that who I am in Christ is not just here, but it's also here. Okay, Not letting him come into our minds and, and deceive ourselves. And, and so now we get to this final piece, the sword of the spirit. And, and Paul writes in verse 17, and the sword of the Spirit, or it says take the helmet of salvation, and also you're taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Just like all the other pieces of armor, okay, the sword of the Spirit is very important. And this is why. Because this piece of armor is the only offensive weapon that you have. What's the point in putting up all the defense if you've got no offense? 
right? And so this is, this is the one piece of offensive weapon that you have. Everything else is designed to hold you up. Everything else is designed to keep you together, to strengthen you in the heat of the battle. But listen, this last piece, this last piece of armor God has put in your hand to fight with yourself. And so I want for the remaining few minutes to share with you just four elements concerning the sword of the Spirit. So let's talk about first. Let's cut right to it. The first thing I want you to see is the description, the description of the sword of the Spirit. Paul says, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In the first century, okay, in the first century Roman warfare, a soldier typically had two types of swords. All right. There was one that was the broader, longer sword, Okay, several feet long. It, it would allow you to fight at a distance because it was extended. But the one that Paul you know, is talking about here, it's more like a dagger. So there were two types of swords. There was the long sword, which is more like a pirate's sword. All right, just for the fun of it. Everybody say, all right. <laughs> yeah. Y'all want to hear a pirate joke? I got a pirate joke for you. Listen to this. Listen to this. How, much, <laughs> how much did the pirate pay... For his piercings. How much? A buccaneer. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Okay. Listen. What does a vegan pirate say in jail? I'm starving. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Just one, just one more. Just one more. Why did, one pi- why did no one want to play cards with the pirate? Because he was standing on the deck. <laughs> Oh, that's cheesy, isn't it? Yeah. So Paul's not talking about a pirate sword here. He's talking about a dagger. Okay, two very, very different swords. Okay, this, this one, the sword of the spirit is a dagger. It's about 18 inches long. It was used for hand-to-hand combat. So let's put it this way. It was in your face combat, all right? Your enemy would be right up close in this type of warfare, okay? It, it, it was needle sharp. It was used to deliver a deadly, victorious blow to your enemy. The dagger was often concealed and carried, all right? All right, so, so that's the concealed carry thing there. And, and, and the belt of the soldier would hold that dagger, always available, always available to use in combat. Always used, though, when the enemy was up close, and striking distance. Now, i got to ask you this as I have every single message up to this point. How many of you, by show of hands, have been engaged in warfare this week? Anybody? Anybody been in warfare this week? Okay. Okay. How many of you could say, can say by show of hands, I've had victory this week in warfare. I've had victory. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Okay. I- I'm sure, though, some of you, including myself, may have lost some battles this week, too. Sometimes in the battle... The devil ain't going to always hide. Sometimes he's not going to always shoot from afar off. Sometimes he's going to be up all in your business, okay? He, he's going to be in your face. He's going to want to be in your life. Sometimes he certainly wants to make the day that you're living the evil day that Paul writes about here in Ephesians 6. And that attack that Satan puts on is up front. That attack is very close and personal. The sword of the spirit, the dagger, was used in hand-to-hand combat, hand-to-hand battle. And Paul tells us to take up the sword of the spirit. You're going to need it. So that's the description of the sword of the spirit. How about this next part? The definition of the sword of the spirit. Look at what it's called here. The sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of... Oh, let's say that with a little more confidence today. The sword of the spirit, which is the what? The Word of God. Very good. Now, now, what does that mean? What does the Word of God mean here? Now, we're going to have to do a little Bible study here. There are two Greek words, okay, in the New Testament for the word, word, all right? There are two different words for the word, word. The first is logos, or logos, okay? Everybody say logos. Logos. All right. Um, That's used in John chapter 1. Logos describes the complete word, the total word. Logos talks about the word that's from God, which is Jesus, a final word, God's word in the flesh, in its totality, the word of God. But it's also uh, the word, that's also the word used for the full account of Scripture. But in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul does not use the word logos. He uses the word rhema. Everybody say rhema. All right. Rema is the sayings of God. That's what that means. He says, take up the sword of the spirit, 
which is the rhema, the, the word of God, the sayings of God, specific sayings, specific scriptures found in the whole word of God, he says, use against the enemy. So here's, here's what it means. In a very real sense, when you open up this book, when you open up this book, you are carrying an armory full of swords. That makes sense? All right? You're not carrying just one sword. You're carrying countless swords, and they're at your disposal. And those swords are used by the Spirit of God, inspired by the Spirit of God. To fight your spiritual enemy in this spiritual battle, you're going to need the Spirit-inspired word, sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. The sword he writes of with the same sword that Peter used in the Garden of Gethsemane. Same type of sword. Okay? Um, it's also the same sword that put James to death in Acts chapter 12, verse 2, this dagger. But the spiritual definition of this sword is far greater than physical. I'm sure that when you heard about the dagger, you started thinking about hand-to-hand -hand combat. You started thinking about blood and violence and all those things. But I want you to understand something. The sword that we use in spiritual conflict is far from just physical. Okay? Jesus told Peter, after Peter missed that guard's head and hit his ear... <laughs> He says, we don't, listen, if you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. Now put that thing away, okay, because you can't use it very well. Uh, but, but you see, our human methodology, our physical ways of protecting ourselves, they don't work against Satan. It goes a step further. As a matter of fact, physical warfare engages the warfare and advances the enemy's agenda. My point is this, killing our physical enemies Using physical means to handle our battles will not work. Going to physical resources for help in the battle will not grant you the peace, will not grant you the joy, will not grant you the assurance and the victory that we're supposed to be in pursuit of, okay? So I'm just going to go ahead and say it like this, all right? Therapies, rehabs, jails, a, a medium, a TV personality, none of these things will help you spiritually unless they're grounded in the sword of the Spirit, Amen. the Word of God. When you choose to use a man-made method to help you in spiritual warfare, you don't have the support or the strength from the Lord Jesus. I know that's hard because a lot of us use man-made things to fight against the spiritual. And that's why we're constantly defeated. That's why we're constantly dry. That's why here I need you to understand it's so important to understand that the sword of the Spirit is used to help you overcome in spiritual battles. This here is an armory of swords. All kinds of swords filled with sayings from God. They are ready for your warfare. They are ready to fight against the enemy. In your hand is an unlimited number of opportunities to defeat the enemy. A number of opportunities, a limited number of opportunities to defeat your enemy in certain circumstances. So it's important for us to understand the definition of the sword of the spirit. It's not a physical sword. It's a spiritual sword. Sword. It's not the whole Bible, but the specific sayings, the Word of God found in the whole Bible. It's multiple swords and a huge ar armory that you and I have at our disposal at all times. Now, that's comforting today. That's comforting. That I have the very Word of God available to me at all times, in all circumstances, in countless ways to help me in the battle. I love what uh, Warren Wiersbe had to say about the sword of the Spirit. He said, a material sword pierces the body, but the Word of God pierces the heart. The more you use the physical sword, the duller it becomes. But using God's Word only makes it sharper in our lives. A physical sword requires the hand of a soldier, but the sword of the Spirit has its own power, for it is living and powerful, Hebrews 4.12. The Spirit uh, wrote the Word so that we can will the Word given to us by Him. A physical sword wounds to hurt and kill, while the sword of the Spirit wounds to heal and gives life. When we use the sword against Satan, we are out to deal him a blow that will cripple him and keep him from hindering the work of God in our lives. Amen. I told you, that's good stuff. The description of the sword, the definition of the sword. Let's talk about now the demonstration of the sword. Now, where do I see this used in the Word of God so that I know what to do when temptation comes, when the warfare begins? If you'll take a look 
um, in your time. I'm just going to summarize it. But if you look in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, you find Jesus in the midst of the battle himself, fighting against the enemy. And you see what Satan here is doing, what he's done all along. Okay, this is what his tactic is to bring someone down. Satan uh, is in hand-to-hand combat with Jesus in Luke 4 and in Matthew 4. And, and here's what he's doing. He's questioning here three things. He's always questioning three things. He's questioning here the provision of God because he tells, he tells Jesus while he's fasting. He's fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. So, so Jesus is starting to get tired. He's starting to get hungry. And so Satan says, all right, I'm going to question I'm going to question the provision of God. Hey, you don't have to wait for God to provide the food. You're God himself. So, so here's what you can do. You can tell these stones to turn into bread. You can do it yourself. You know what? He also questioned the position of God that he had in Jesus' life. So he shows him all the kingdoms of the world. And Satan says, if you'll just bow down and worship me, I'll, 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 you know what? I'll give you the best the world has to offer. I'll give you all the kingdoms. So you know what? God's position in your life not so big, not so important. I'm going to give you everything that the world has to offer. And then he questioned the presence of God in Jesus' life too. He says, you know what? Jump off the highest point of the temple. And you know what the word says. The angels, they're, they're, going, to, they're going to save you. You're the son of God. They're going to save you. Just put that to the test. Satan's trying to get Jesus to stumble in the scripture. You know what? Satan knows the word of God too. Sometimes, You know what? Satan might know the word of God better than you do. And that's scary. But here's what Satan does a lot of times. Satan will leave out parts. Satan will also say things out of context. Some of you folks uh, may, may have fallen into this trap before. You read a scripture and you read it out of context. And so when you read a scripture like Philippians 4, 13, where it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Some people read that verse and they say, you know what? I can do all things through Christ, which means that, you know what? Uh, I, God, God wants my, want me to be rich, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go play the lottery. <laughs> and God's going to get me out of it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play casino games. And I'm going to get rich because God wants me to be rich. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> so I, with all the strength that I have, I'm going to give to Christ. I'm going to make all the money that I can. You end up broke and you're like, well, that verse ain't true. <laughs> you see what I mean? How about this? You test that verse in physical context and people say, you know, it says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand in the midst of traffic. I'm going to stand in the midst of a tornado. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand in the midst of a war zone and nothing's going to ever be able to bring me down because the Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I want you to remember this. As you think about how Satan attacks our minds and our hearts, Satan will use the word of God against you. Philippians 4.13, it was written from a jail. Paul was in jail when he wrote Philippians 4.13. And he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He was nasty. He was cold. He was food deprived. He was in jail. And so what does he mean? Does he mean I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? Does he mean I can kick myself out of this jail? That's not what he meant. That means that whatever circumstance I'm in, I'm content. God's going to give me the strength to carry out his will. I'm content with God's will for my life. Listen, I'm just telling you, be careful, be careful that you read the the Word of God in context, folks, in context. Because if He wills it, God will give you the strength to do anything. Another verse that we take out of context at times is God is love. 1 John 4, 16, people say God is love so people shouldn't go to hell. God is love so people shouldn't go through hardships. God is love so people shouldn't be judged. That's not what the verse means. It means that God is love. It's who He is. But it doesn't take away the righteousness of God, does it? It doesn't take away our sin problem. It doesn't take away His justice and discipline. You can be love and still discipline. I know I'm a parent. <laughs> okay? I discipline my kids in love. <clears throat> All right? You do it too. Satan's goal is for people to look in the Bible and get confused and get discouraged and cause them to question the Word of God. So when Satan is saying, you know, all these things against Jesus and all against the Lord, against the provision of God and the place of God and the position of God, what did Jesus do? How did he fight the enemy? He did it with Scripture. He did it with a sword, with the Word of God. And so he quoted Scripture. Deuteronomy 8.3 he says, Man cannot live by bread alone, but by the very Word of God. Okay, Satan comes back at him and he says, All right, I'll give you all the things, you know, all the things of the world. And Jesus says back to him, Satan, get behind me. It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Deuteronomy 6.13. And then once again, Satan's tempting him and saying, Jump off this temple. 
Jump off it and angels are going to save you. And Jesus responds, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And you know what happened? <coughs> Satan left. It only took three blows. <laughs> three blows of the word of God. Satan left. What did Jesus use? What's the demonstration here? Jesus used the sword of the spirit. Jesus used the word of God and we read that the devil fled. Jesus put James chapter 4 verse 7 to practice. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. I need you to know this today. I need you to remember this today as you go out into the warfare. Satan is no match whatsoever for the word of God. God. Amen. No match. You can demonstrate the power and effectiveness of the sword just like Jesus did. Now, I want to give you one more demonstration. If you look in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul, or 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 through 4, Paul told Timothy that the time would come in this life, the time would come that the world would not endure sound doctrine. He said, Timothy, there's going to come a time when people are not going to want to hear the truth. They're going to want to hear what tickles their ears, he says. They're going to hear that, what, makes, you know, what sounds good to them. They're going to want to turn away from the truth. And instead of turning to the Word of God, they're going to turn to myths instead. And Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.2, your defense for the world that's going wayward, your defense is to, he said, preach the Word. That's what he told Timothy to do. Preach the Word. Be ready. In season, out of season. Be prepared. Be ready to fight to face false doctrine, to face false teachers. Be ready to address your church family at all times. And he says, Rebu reprove them if you have to. Rebuke them if you have to. Correct. Discipline. And then he says, don't you forget to encourage them. Don't you forget to exhort them. With great patience and instruction, Paul told Timothy, the best help that you have in the battles you face is the word of God. <clears throat> know it, he says to Timothy. Believe it, he says to Timothy. Use it. And church, I'm, I'm encouraging you today. If we are going to win the battles that we face, the temptations that you face, the sinful opportunities that come your way, those arrows, those darts, those accusations that headhunt you, that heart hunt you, if the, if the enemy's going to fight continually against you, if you're going to have victory, your source is the word, uh, uh, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, inspired by the Spirit, infused by the Spirit, influenced by the very Spirit of God. It's at your disposal. Folks, it's in your hands right now. So what I want to tell you to do today is stop trying to fight your spiritual battles with the physical. Listen, there is no drug, there is no doctor, there is no medium therapist, educator, book writer, motivational speaker, politician, or preacher that can win this battle for you. You've got it in your hands. You've got the sword of the spirit to fight the enemy. So stop trying to fight the, the spiritual with the physical and fight the enemy. Stick it to the enemy with the word of God. Hey, I just said stick it to the enemy. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Last thing, I'm done. The decision to use the sword of the spirit. Just like every bit of the other armor, you have a decision to make today. And we've got to ask ourselves this. Will I decide to win this war with the very word of God? Will I decide to live my life God's way? Will I decide in my heart today to declare victory over my enemy? It is your choice. It is your choice. It's my choice to suit up on a daily basis. It's my choice to be battle ready on a daily basis. It's my choice to be under armor on a daily basis. But you and I, we have to make that decision We've got to make a decision whether or not we're going to armor up. Paul did it. Paul did it from a Roman jail. Paul wrote the Ephesian church. And you know what? You know what he asked them to do? Paul in the Ephesian jail, he, because he loved God's word and because he preached God's word, Paul had so many opportunities to say no to Jesus. Paul had many opportunities to say, you know what? I back out of this fight. I don't want to fight the enemy anymore. I'll say yes to the enemy. I'll say yes to those who are persecuting me. I'll say yes to those who are trying to kill me uh, in, in contendence for the faith. But Paul says, you know what? He didn't say this gospel ain't working. He didn't say I'm in jail yet again. Instead, he said, yes, the gospel must be working because I'm in jail again. <laughs> and, and you know what he said? The vision brothers and sisters, he finishes out the sixth chapter by saying, 
pray for me. And what does he ask them to pray for? He says, pray for me that I may boldly open my mouth to make known the mystery of the gospel. In so many words, Paul says, church, pray that I will keep on preaching the gospel because it is the gospel, the word of God, the sword of the spirit that will defeat the enemy. Pray that I will stay in the word, speak strongly the word, stand in the heat of this battle strongly in the power of the Lord through his word. And church, you have been given you have been given the necessary armor to give you full victory every moment of every day, every thought, every word, every action in your life to engage and enable yourselves to win the battle against the enemy. You've got it. You've got it. You've heard it. You don't have to live in fear of the enemy. You don't have to do that. You are armed with truth. You are armed with righteousness. You are armed with the gospel of peace. You are armed with faith. You are armed with salvation. And you've got the sword of the Spirit. The Word of God. And my challenge to you today as we finish up this series, go to war. And live in the victory that's already yours because of Jesus Christ. We're going to have a moment of invitation. I'd like to ask you, if you would, just to bow your heads with me. And I need you to remember something today as we close out. I need you to remember this battle is always won by the Word of God. It's always won. Not the efforts of man, but by the Word of God. Listen, this is the reality. Some of you folks may be trying to live and fight this battle apart from Jesus, apart from the Word made flesh. And listen, today, you may be at a crossroads yourself right now, and you've got to make the decision. Who is my Lord? Who is my Savior? Who is my Master? Whose side of the fight am I on? Who and what will be my authority? And I want to just say this today. If it isn't good, it isn't God. And you've got to understand, some here today may need to surrender themselves to the, Lord, to the Lord. Surrender themselves to Jesus Christ. Surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. I want you to know today, if that's you, I want you to know that you can live in confidence. You can have victory today in the fact that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You need victory? Pursue Christ. Have a relationship with Christ. He's already pursuing you. He wants you to be a part of his army. And so today, if you're here and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can simply believe on Jesus with your life. The Bible says to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that Christ has been raised from the dead and you will be saved. So what I'm going to do for a moment is I'm going to pray. And if you feel like in your heart that you need to give your heart to Jesus Christ, you can pray along with me, but you can pray something like this. Mean it with your heart. Lord, thank you for paying the price for my sins. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. I, Lord, admit that I'm a sinner. I know that I have fallen short. Your word tells me that, but I'm in need of your forgiveness. And I believe that Jesus came to do just that. Jesus came to forgive me of my sin. Jesus came to give me eternal life. I was helpless. I was hopeless, Lord. And you paid the price. And I believe today. I believe that what Jesus did for me is for me, for my salvation. And I want to commit my life to you. I want to confess my sins. I ask that you would forgive me and cleanse me of my sins. And I now turn from my wickedness. I repent. And I place my faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, save my soul today. I want to walk in victory. With your head still bowed and your eyes still closed, is there someone today who prayed to receive Christ? And with all today, St. Peter, I, I put my faith and my trust in Jesus. I want to be victorious for eternity. If that's you, would you just lift your hand? Anybody at all today, St. Peter, I, I want to be saved today and I trust in Christ today for my salvation. Anybody? Anybody? Listen, church, you're Christian soldiers. How many of you would be so honest today to say, Peter, I really want to have victory in these spiritual battles I face, but I need prayer. I need help. I need support. I'm struggling. Peter, would you pray for me? 
Is there anyone today saying, Peter, I'm just in need of prayer. Just lift your hand high. I need prayer in this battle. I need prayer. All right. All right. Father, I want to pray today for our precious church family. I love them. I rejoice in what you've done for them. I thank you, God, for the victory that we have in Jesus every day. I'm thankful that you didn't leave us clueless on how we're supposed to fight this war. You gave us the full armor of God to fight against the enemy. And you didn't give us the armor so that we would have a close call victory. You gave us the armor so that we would dominate, so that we would conquer, so the enemy could not even have a foot, a, a step into our lives. You, Lord, will not be tempted by the enemy. You will not be thwarted by the enemy. You have already defeated him. And it's past time that the church realizes that because Jesus has victory, we have victory too. May we claim that in the Lord Jesus Christ. May we walk in that. May we believe that. May we share that with the world. And may we share that with the enemy. If he ever tries to rear his head into our life, into our family, into our business, he has no place. We rebuke the enemy and we exalt Jesus. And so I pray for those today that are saying, I, I, I'm struggling in this battle. I need your strength. May they look no further than the word of God for their peace, for their comfort. I pray that when the enemy presents himself to them, and he's trying to tempt them that they would not be overcome, but they would remember with the sword of the Spirit they have the dagger that can take the enemy out. May they get in the book. May they get in the Word. May they study the Word. May they, Lord, rejoice in the Word. May they believe the Word and live out the Word of God. I do pray today that they have been encouraged. I do pray today that they have worshipped and they have enjoyed your presence today. It's certainly been a wonderful privilege to be in your house today. We love you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Hey, uh, listen, um, I want to...